Okay, I think it's time to start the session, the industrial session, and this is uh, co-organized by Tampere University and uh, Robocost. Um, my name is Jari Normi, I'm from Tampere University and I will chair the second half of this session and, and the first half will be chaired by Pauline Harivara, so I, I pass over to her. Yes, thank you, Jari. Um, uh, welcome all on behalf of Robocoast as well. Uh, we are happy to co-host this event uh, together with uh, Tampere University and High Peak. Um, we also have online, uh, we have great speakers from our companies, uh, but we also have online from our team, uh, our uh, main High Peak representative, Juhabe Kalanen. Uh, maybe you can say hello, Juha Pekka, or, or, or uh, say hello in the chat um, if you're not available to, uh, to, to open your video. And then we also have Pirita Ihamaki uh, as part of our Robocos team here. Uh, and maybe we will have to have more speakers from our team as well later. Um, we will start this industrial session uh, with one of our uh, uh, let's say cloud computing expertise companies. Uh, we had have several uh, R&D cases with the industries and we are happy to hear uh, some of the, the cases which you have. So I would like to uh, represent you Kai Vainio, uh, CEO from uh, Dume Solutions. Uh, we are happy to have you here. So uh, please, please uh, let's, uh, let's uh, hear from you. Uh, what kind of solutions do you have for different industries utilizing, for example, cloud computing and, and other technology? All right. Thank you, Paulina. <clears throat> and hello to everyone. Uh, I'll start my presentation, just a moment. Uh, please, someone verify if you can see the first slide. Yes, it's here. All right, excellent. Uh, so, a company is called Dume Solutions. We pronounce it like Dume, not Dime or anything. We just like to call it Dume. Uh, our company was founded in 2014. We are a software development company. That's our main focus. We have 13 professionals at the moment. Uh, most of them are highly experienced uh, senior or specialist or architect level developers. Uh, we also have some students, of course, um, and also some senior level, but we try to maintain um, how to say that that our developers are, are well experienced and have seen a lot of different kinds of aspects related to software development industry uh, uh, this year our revenue is about 1 million euros uh, we've been we have written uh, many many lines of code so we are a software development company and we do a lot of custom software for different uh, business domains. So we are like business domain agnostic. We, we like to think about software development and coding that it's not that related to a specific business domain. You can find uh, similar aspects from all domains, like uh, almost every software or application uh, that we do, they, there's always some kind of user registration. Uh, there's always going to be some place where you store the data. And then you somehow process the data. And finally, uh, you have a front end, whether it's web application or whether it's a mobile application, but somehow you're going to show it to the user. So almost every every software that we make has these these components, and uh, so that way I don't see that 
you have to know that much about the business domain you're working with in term if you look at it from the software development perspective yeah and all of our professionals are located here at in Pori and in this Satakunta area, which is in the western part of Finland. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, our focus areas are in these three main platforms or, or technologies. So uh, we are focusing on cloud development at the moment, uh, mostly on native cloud development on AWS. So what that means is, uh, is that we try to utilize as many services from AWS as possible. And then we extend it with uh, our own piece of software, which we mainly develop on top of serverless framework. Uh, we've been doing serverless software for over three years now, so almost, I would say, not in the beginning, but I think we are one of the early adopters of serverless frameworks, and we have already uh, developed quite of extensive systems on top of these technologies. Uh, and AWS plays a very, very high role in in each of our projects at the moment. Uh, it's, it's not that we, we are against of Google or, or Microsoft Azure or anything, but uh, at the moment it just has been so that we've been focusing on AWS. We have done some development also on, on Microsoft and Google's platform. So that's, that's okay also, but but as I said, AWS at the moment is the biggest one. And on the mobile development side, we are mainly using Flutter at the moment. And we, we have very good experiences on developing software with, with Flutter. And uh, it's we have been trying all kinds of, uh, in the beginning of the company, we, we mostly develop native applications then we tried uh, like uh, native script and react native and all those kind of frameworks we also tried phone gap in in history and all sorts of things but at the moment it, it seems to us that flutter is the best tool so far so we are we are eagerly trying to adopt it more and and find the best ways we can benefit from using it. Yeah, so these these are the main focuses at the moment. Of course, we do a lot of uh, web development for the front end part, but uh, there seems to be so much turbulence on that side. Those JavaScript frameworks come and go, but at the moment we have done a lot of development on React and with Angular of course so those are the biggest ones to us uh, also some aurelia framework and so on but, um, as a, from company's perspective we try to uh, keep focus on what is happening in this uh, in, in software development uh, field in general and try to maintain our expertise and always choose some a bit of old good tools and then some new tools also when a, for example a new project starts so we have a always something new to learn but also something old that we can rely on that's our strategy and i would like to show you one uh, one reference an example of our work uh, we have been working almost two years with this company called Honkajoki uh, Honkajoki is a uh, is a leading uh, processor of animal byproducts which means that uh, if you take like uh, you eat meat so there's a slaughterhouse where where that meat 
is manufactured. So there's a lot of byproducts from that process. Uh, a lot of fat, uh, blood, all, all kinds of parts from those. For example, if we think about chicken or, or poultry or, or that kind of, well, whatever. There's a lot of byproducts and, and Honkajoki is the biggest uh, processor in Finland. So they take all that byproduct and process it and generate uh, new materials from those byproducts. Uh, it can be uh, raw material for uh, biodiesel, for example, or fish food or that kind of things. Uh, fertilizers, cosmetics, even pharmaceuticals or that kind of stuff. There are a lot of ways to use that recycled byproduct material. So what that, how that relates to us is that we have developed a, a concept called Honkajoki Cloud. And Honkajoki Cloud is an AWS based uh, cloud service, uh, which we have been built from scratch. And basically what it does is that we gather everything that is related to this uh, process of uh, handling these byproducts in Honkajoki facilities. So we collect all the data that we, we are able to collect, depending on how that is stored at the moment and how mature those systems are. But, but the biggest ones are, of course, the process itself and its automation. Uh, we collect all the measurement data from that process and send it to the cloud where we store it, we store everything, and then we analyze it in real time and provide a product mo monitoring uh, front end, which is a web application, uh, which is used by the, uh, the process engineers and, and all the people that are, that are handling the process. Uh, but we also collect data from logistics, which is very important part of the whole process because these byproducts are, they are like live material and, and they, and their quality starts to decrease at the moment that it's, you know, in the process of slaughtering. And it's, it's important that it is transported as fast as possible from the slaughterhouse to the processing facility. So we are, uh, collecting data of those, um, how long does it take uh, to, to transfer that material and try to analyze it and improve it and, and tell those logistic uh, companies that, hey, you need to move this faster and please change this and that and so on. So that's one part. And we, we collect all the logistic data into the cloud, analyze it and provide a view for the process engineers to that, to that data. And then we also, there's a lot of processes in this kind of system. So we collect it and analyze it. Yeah, was there some question or something? No, okay. Um, and in the cloud, uh, there's a lot of data. There are uh, like, uh, 500 uh, measure 500,000 measurements coming in each day so there's a lot of data to handle and we've been collecting that data for two years now so it's not a very simple uh, system anymore there's a lot of different we have to all these uh, data sources are handled differently and their data is aggregated uh, pretty complex ways to like, depending on the need, it's on the minute level or in the hour level or day level or week level or month level or however the, the end user wants to see the data. So we are 
we are processing it quite heavily, so to speak. And if you look at if you look at the future, uh, we are heading to towards machine learning and artificial intelligence, so that we could apply it here. So we could find, uh, for example, the things that affect on the end quality of the uh, I mean the quality of the end product. So we could find everything that is related to it and. So we could tell the process engineers that how they could improve the process. Yeah. Mm. What else? Well, that's we are very proud of this system, and and I think customer is pretty happy about for this about this system at the moment, and we are continuing to develop in in daily basis. So this is a good example of what we do here at Duma Solutions. Yeah. That's about it. Thank you. If you have any questions now or later. <laughs> Thank you, Kai. I think we actually have time for one or two questions. We have the uh, questions uh, in the chat which you can use but i can also if you would like to ask something uh, personally now face to face we have a few minutes so if some of you have questions please feel free or was there some questions in the was the q and a mm -hmm. uh, this, not at the moment no but if you have some questions we we would have time for a few few ones Yes, please. <laughs> and we will uh, share these slides, or Heidi will share the slides, so you will get the presentations. Uh, and there is, of course, you can check the info uh, and find the details also later. Um, I could maybe ask one question, uh, which, which uh, I partly know the answer, but I think it's also an interesting question to, to hear or hear more about your views. You also, also mentioned that um, uh, you like to uh, offer your services or, or bring technology to new fields, if I understand correctly. Uh, yes. Would you like to say a few words on that? Is it, uh, how, how do you manage to bring new technologies to, to cases like Honkajoki, which are quite specific? To, do you need uh, skills or, or background info? How do you manage with all of these different industries? Uh, what, is, what is the secret to that? <laughs> I I think the secret is that that uh, as I said in the beginning or at least tried to say is that uh, these have some same characteristic. Uh, it's a hard work. The, I mean the systems are pretty pretty similar if you look at it from the software development perspective. So whether is this kind of uh, well this have this Honkajoki has its specific features, but even this system has, they have, the, here you can see, there are places where you store the data and then you handle the data and finally present the data. So uh, many systems are really, really like similar and it doesn't have anything to do with uh, any, whether it's done to healthcare or whether it's done here at uh, uh, industry or, is it sports or anything that they are so similar and I think this cloud um, services make it even easier to manage all different kinds of domains and and big benefit in the cloud is also that it, it's quite cheap and easy to use a lot of these services that are available. It, it doesn't mean you don't need any background knowledge about those. You have to study those and you have to understand some basic concepts really well. So you are able to utilize these services in the best way possible. But when you have these good background skills and, and experience from software development in general, you're able to use these and, and be productive on any area. Yeah. Thank you, Kai. That's a, 
good answer, and I think we could continue this discussion also further. We uh, we have luckily we have also uh, a lot of other cases as well. We will see what kind of answer to this question does. For example, Ossi Porri have maybe we can ask the same question from here him as well. Um, thank you, Kai. Um, we will hear more about uh, Dume solutions. Now I know how to pronounce it. I know how to pronounce it in Finland, and now, now I know also how to pronounce it in, in English. So, so thanks a lot. Uh, and we will hear more about you uh, at the second second part, also at the afternoon. I think it's uh, three o'clock Finnish time. So, so we will, yeah. or a bit later, but but the session is starting at three o'clock. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, next we will have uh, Ossi Borri from uh, Wire Labs. Uh, is Ossi online at the moment? Yes, I'm here. Yes, great. Uh, we are happy to have more uh, Finnish companies, but also uh, companies from Satakunta and companies from Robocoast, which will share new technologies and uh, and we will hear how your companies has utilized new technologies in different industries. Thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I mean, shortening the time, I mean, I, I supposed to have my meet, uh, presentation in half an hour, but it's now. So yes, uh, we are to my office. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, so. we are grateful for, for your flexibility. We had some changes in the schedule and also time zone. So, um, but please, please let us know uh, what is your view on, on these subjects. No problem. I, I mean, let's start. To, I will. I will share the presentation. And, and uh, uh, actually, uh, as I was uh, asked to give, uh, oh, let's see. Uh, I was asked to give a presentation about the solution which we have made. I, I chosen one, and but basic, but I, I would start with uh, with quickly going through what's wire labs. So. Uh, so uh, first of all, my name is Ossipori, and uh, my role is, is business development director. So uh, now coding questions for me later on. Uh, what I do is is I manage with uh, with with the discussion together with our partners. So what we do is we create uh, products for our partners, and I will present today. One of our good partner uh, is is uh, Fleet Care. We are fleet care, uh, so it's rail industry. But first, uh, us, uh, we were founded in uh, 2011, so we are quite a small company. Uh, 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 just a bit more than 10 people working. Uh, and uh, previously, years back, uh, we started with uh, coding. Uh, coding for, uh, actually, we were a part of the big company, uh, but uh, later on, we decided to that it's not any more fun to work in in a company where, where there is thousands and thousands of people working so we wanted to be a bit more agile which meant that uh, we we put our own company wire labs together so we all have a background from the amd 80 uh, qualcomm so heavy this kind of uh, combined hardware software uh, uh, background and uh, and also uh, some AI graphics technologies capabilities. So we decided that we put our own company and start to do first. First, we started to do coding, and actually half of us is still doing coding for uh, like uh, rightware. So uh, if if there is a new Ford F one fifty and there is a nice dashboard, it's coded by one of our guys as well helped in, in with the uh, with the right there but we uh, so we do part of the coding but a uh, few years back we decided that uh, this is going nowhere I mean it's nice to do projects for our our uh, and, and nice to have a, a good clients but we don't get the I, our own IPR uh, together so we decided that we have to we want to have our own equipment own hardware and uh, as we didn't find any suitable, we designed uh, our own Wirebox AI gateway product, which is now used uh, in, in our solutions. And the uh, idea is that uh, it's, it's industrial PC, which is uh, 
uh, designed to be used in machine vision, artificial AI solutions. And it's, it's uh, something which uh, we use as a platform. So uh, when a customer comes to us uh, with a problem, we have a kind of 95% is, is already uh, coded. And, and so it enables us to make a very quick prototyping and, and quick uh, proof of concept uh, projects. Usually it takes kind of, uh, I would say, a few weeks to put up the POC together. And as it's our hardware and, and, and our software as well, we have very flexible to detach, uh, to attach uh, different cameras, sensors, etc. to it. And uh, this has led to a situation where, where our capabilities are, are best used in, in uh, where we make the core, make, make the data management and the data, the heavy, heavy calculations in the edge. So we are not taking every, everything uh, to, to, uh, to cloud. But the idea is that, that where you have a lot of like video feeds, there are lots of data, there's no point of taking all that to edge. Uh, but but we are using uh, our own device, and there's some integration, of course, integrations possible for different uh, process solution systems and so on. And uh, we can get to these customers, uh, but but uh, like the use cases, what we have, uh, there is now a new tram uh, built it in Tampere. So in each tram there is our box. Uh, so in there, it's called a smart tram gateway, and it's it's sold by uh, Skoda Transtech, but it's our our Ybox AI, so it's personalized for them. Then we have another uh, use case, which is uh, the smart railway gateway, and we will get to that a bit later. And and a, a few others, uh, we have a Raisi Agro, where we make a quality control. And for MIPRO, we do some, uh, we uh, record everything like a black box of a railway. We, uh, we record everything what happens in uh, railway junctions. So if there are some problems, we will know uh, what, what really happened. Yes, let's go. I will change the, I will change the to other presentation. But what I uh, wanted to show to you today is the is this is one of the solution which was actually published uh, weeks back weeks ago uh, by via fleet care and this is kind of points out that uh, what we do and and uh, this specific case so uh, as you as you know that there is uh, people are not too happy if the trains are late so uh, it's very crucial to have a reliable service on on railway and, and, and that hardware in the railway area, it's industry, it's, which has been there for decades, which means that there are a lot of, uh, it's not, it's, it's very, very reliable as uh, hardware, but it's, it's from that era that there was no <laughs> digital <laughs> connections. It's, it's analog. And, and, and so uh, what, what, we, what they would like us to do and help them out is to, kind of upgrade the current uh, measurements uh, uh, from the from the switches. So uh, each switch there is, a, uh, uh, I mean, each switch there is no no data collection. They just, I mean, the switch informs that if, if you send a signal that, okay, you have to turn the switch and then switch just returns that, okay, now it's everything is fine or everything is not fine but you don't have any, any more uh, data or details what really happens in the switch. And this is uh, of course a bit problematic because uh, if you don't have this remote monitoring, you don't know is the maintenance enough? Is there failure coming? So uh, what they would like us to help out is in this productive uh, maintenance. So help them out to uh, know problems before they even happen. And uh, what we did, uh, we, we did uh, for the Finnish Transport Infrastructure Agency, uh, Väula, uh, called Finnish, we made them a system where we upgraded the current uh, switch, switches to, to, uh, and integrated some data collection. 
and and we we now collect uh from the switches uh i i would say a huge amount of data uh, every turn in the switch yard is recorded by us which means that we have now collected during the summer about uh, i would say one million turns and and so it's a quite a huge uh, data source now to uh, evaluate uh, the the problems even beforehand and uh, understand what what really happens in the switches and so we provide the, so we provide the box and the measurement system and the fleet care has the industry knowledge. Uh, they will understand of what, what to do with the data, how, how to change the uh, maintenance processes of the industry to, to really harness uh, the, the benefits of the system. In many cases in, in our, our projects, we, it's not just uh, what we have to change, it's not uh, only the hardware setup or the, the calculations or algorithms, but it's also the working processes. Without that, we are not getting the, the benefits uh, possible. So the fleet care provides uh, not just the, I mean, they provide our, our designed uh, measurement devices, the, the service, the monitoring service, they collect and, and use the uh, data and report the customer and for the maintenance companies. And the idea is to, to predict uh, the, the problems and, and make the traffic uh, flow uh, go without any interruptions. So here are the, actually the areas, uh, areas uh, used in, in, the, in the system. Uh, our field was the sensors and the gateway, the data plot platform we, we set it up for the for the fleet care and also these uh, reports and interfaces for for accessing the data from the user point of view. And uh, as mentioned, we have uh, lots of understanding of for the hardware and also the user interface part, but the industry understanding comes from our our partners. Uh, at this case, we are fleet care who is selling selling the system. And I would say as, as the fleet care is, it's a big company, they are much more uh, better partner for if, if you think about like a, like a national railway of, of uh, Nordics or some other country, it's, it's better suited uh, partner for, for buying such solution than buy it from, uh, I know we have uh, 12 people working, but it's a bit different if, if uh, we are group, I think they have uh, some 100 times that uh, people working. Yes, uh, let's see. Now it's 10. Uh, I think uh, now there's some five minutes uh, for questions. I think this is my last slide. Let's see if there's something to say. I, I think I think I have covered. It's now easy to, if there's no connection to the people listening, it's, it's very hard to understand how we're going too, fa too fast or too slow, but I hope you can help. Uh, let's see, there's still uh, about the data, as you can see, there's, uh, we analyze each turn and, and as we have lots of turns, then we can analyze what happens in different models of switches. Uh, what kind of problems there are and, and know uh, for the problems what happened before the problems so we can predict predict the, the situation. Yep, that's it. So, uh, I think you had a possibility for some questions or, or uh, so how, how you have done it. Thank you, Osti. Uh, great presentation. Whether from car or from other kind of office, we can see a great Finnish nature behind you. So this is, <laughs> uh, I think, might be uh, a great uh, experience for all the viewers, whether you have visited Finland or, or not. I, uh, I checked we have the Q&A. Uh, um, part, if you can, it's possible to use that one, or we also have uh, time for a few uh, real life questions as well. 
um, I might ask one, uh, one uh, the, the same which I asked from Kai from Dume Solutions that uh, I think you have some ideas or, or, or you had some, some thoughts about um, bringing technology into different fields uh, like uh, traditional industries and so on. So I'd like to ask that how do you see, is it easy or what are the key success uh, competencies in bringing a new technologies to, uh, to uh, let's say, traditional industry. How, how do we, how, how do you manage that, or what are your tips for succeeding in that field? I mean, I'm a big fan of of uh, lean and and uh, lean startup, which means that uh, find a problem worth solving. I mean, if if the if there's no problem to solve, then I mean, there's no point for new technology either. So in many of these cases, uh, which we have, usually the, the customer, the, the industry, uh, the, the company who knows the industry, they, they say that, okay, we have been having this problem now for 10 years or 20 years and we don't know what to do with. Or we, uh, like with Vesto, they patented, uh, they have a patent for a solution, but they were not capable of doing uh, and, and creating the solution. They don't, they don't have the technical capabilities, so we help them in that. So, so it's very crucial to have a, to find a problem worth solving. If there's no problem, there's no point. Very straightforward uh, approach. Um, we have, uh, thank you, we actually have one question from Luca uh, Makan. I don't know if you pronounce it correctly. Um, it's uh, can you use this for road optimization? It was two minutes ago when when uh, the question was here, so maybe it was for for a specific case. Um, uh, I mean, for the for this which we did for fleet care, it's not the mm -hmm. uh, road optimization, but I mean, if you if you have uh, trains, idea it's it's a predictive maintenance. So for the switches. So that's the that's the use case. So, uh, but of course, uh, when they know that and, and know that there is a, will be a failure in switch, they will use in in the traffic control uh, to reroute the trains to avoid uh, the problem area. So, our solution itself it won't do the rerouting, but the data which it provides helps out rerouting. Yeah, I think there's the Elmas. Uh, can I ask for the Elmas uh, question as well? Yes, of course. I, I wasn't sure if you can see the, the Q and A as well, but please. Yes, please. yes, I have. Uh, it, thanks for the <laughs> thanks for the capabilities. <laughs> uh, I uh, I mean, we sell the production platform itself. So uh, we we what we are selling we are selling the capabilities of doing uh, the POC in three weeks. So and and uh, so this kind of a fail fast uh, in in few weeks it's uh, very uh, I I think that the, our customers like it I mean if if they have problem which they have uh, had for years and somebody says that okay we can try out we can do our best in few months they usually are very keen to try out that that are, are we can we really deliver and. Uh, if you think about uh, then and selling the, the solution itself, then of course uh, that's the re reason why we rely on fleet care. I mean, if you want to uh, buy a switch monitoring uh, service, you are not buying from the kind of startup <laughs> from us, but you you buy it uh, from 100 year old beer fleet care. <laughs> so very established company. And how you are sure about your product? Uh, I would say that in, in this case, the, these industry experts, like in the VR fleet care, they will evaluate our capabilities when they, because they have to be sure that we can deliver what we promised before they sell it again for their customers, because they, they put their uh, reputation on the line if they, uh, as they are selling a total solution, which includes our product as well. 
Thank you, Osi. And can we have your presentation to shared by Heidi to all the participants? Is it possible? Yes, I will. I will now. Uh, I can put it together and send it to you. Yes, no yes, problem. Great. Th thank you, Ossi. Uh, we are almost on on schedule, uh, and we will continue with with uh, technological innovations from Satakunta, uh, and we will have Jyrki Antonen, uh, technological officer from Simport, next, um, and also we have here Sonia Harvesto from Simport Corp as well. And you have uh, 90 minutes for your presentation and questions. Okay, good afternoon, Paulina, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I will, just a second, I will share my screen. Should be able to see it now. Not yet. Not yet, just a second. No. Maybe now. Yes, now it's working, perfect. Okay, it's good. All right, uh, I, I will begin. So, Simcorp is the company. My name is Jürgen Antonen, and I work as, as the technology director in, in our company. We are based in Satakunta, Finland, as, as Paulina said. And I was asked to give, give a presentation of Simcorp as a company and also something about our technologies. So let's begin begin with the company presentation itself. Just a second, I'll try to hide something from my screen. Okay, so as it says here in, in, in the uh, screen, Simcorp is a total solution provider for interlogistics and we manufacture and integrate end-to-end -end automated material handling systems and provide comprehensive life cycle services. So what does that mean? First of all, this total solution refers to automated material handling systems. Part of the solution is our own technology and part we buy from elsewhere. But I would say that the key here is that we talk about turnkey systems and SimCorp is the systems integrator. And secondly, interlogistics. I would say that in, in SimCorp's case, at least and according to my own interpretation, interlogistics means optimizing both the material and data flows inside the walls of a factory or a distribution center. And our services, they don't end to the moment when we deliver and hand over the system to our customers. We intend to form a longer relationship with them by providing lifecycle services like 24-7 help desk, spare part services and maintenance services. So about our customers. Today we have two main business areas logistics automation. This includes food and beverage industry. And, and this sector is something that started from local Finnish producers like breweries, dairies and bakeries. Retail and e-commerce distribution. I would say that today, this is one of the most important sectors for Simcorp. And a good example of this is uh, Mercadona one of the leading supermarket and online shopping companies in Spain. Last year, Mercadona placed an order worth of uh, 120 million euros for Simcorp to automate fresh food, fresh food distribution in four of its distribution centers in Spain. Postal industry, at the moment it has a little smaller role, but it is still there. And then, the other business area is tire industry. In recent years, this has been very important for Simcorp. Again, this started from a local Finnish producer, Nokian Tires, and it quickly expanded to a global business. And today, Simcorp is uh, one of the top suppliers in the industry worldwide. 
most of this business comes from tire manufacturers, but we also have some tire distribution customers. And in, uh, if we think about the share of these two business areas, I, I would say that in, in long term, we aim to have them more or less 50-50, because we want to have two strong legs to stand on. But of course, depending of or depending on the timing of some big project, the share will change from year to year. And we do have a long experience in managing international projects and we have installations in over 40 countries and on six continents. And here you can see some examples of our customers. Tire industry actually started in 2001. And today, seven out of the 10 biggest tire manufacturers are Simcox customers. And logistics automation, since 1996, we have delivered warehousing and picking systems to food and beverage retailers in Europe, Asia, North America, and Australia. So looking at these uh, references here, you can see many, many big tire manufacturers, but also some other ones too. And uh, today we belong to Muratek Group, as it says here, the official name of our Japanese parent company is Murata Machinery. And Simcorp belongs to its logistics and automation division. And the numbers on this slide, they apply for this division only. The whole Muratek itself, it has over 7,700 employees and about 2.5 billion euro revenue. And as you can see, Muratek is world's fourth largest logistic automation supplier. So in that sense, we definitely have a good owner. They are committed to develop us in long term and also their product portfolio complements ours very nicely. And of course, we act as a kind of gateway to Europe for Muratek's own, own technology. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Simcorp is a solution provider and a systems integrator. And an example of our solutions and systems can be seen here. Simcorp Dream Factory, in the very beginning, this was a dream, but today it is reality. Uh, dream Factory is Syncorp's autom automated material handling solution for tire manufacturing. And it uh, basically takes care of automatic material transport and buffering throughout the whole tire manufacturing process. Starting from the point where the different raw materials enter the factory and ending to the point where finished tires are being shipped out from the factory. And to give you an idea of the scale, the length of the system or, or the length of the tire factory in the picture can be up to one kilometer. And of course, it is rare to deliver automation for the whole factory at a time, but in a greenfield project, that is also possible and we have done it. But typically we automate one process area at a time. Uh, this example was from tire industry. Uh, in, in the logistic automation business area, which was the other business area, we also have similar solutions to automate either the material flow of a distribution center or then automate, aut automate warehousing or the picking and shipping of a food or beverage manufacturing plant. And in both business areas, we use basically the same technology, like our own gantry robots. Then uh, some numbers and facts. Simcorp as a company was established in 1975. Today, as, as already told, fully owned by Japanese Murata Machinery since 2014. We have over 500 employees. Group revenue is uh, in the range of 130 million euros. Global headquarters here in Uvila, Finland. North American head office in Grimsby, Canada. 
And then we have offices also in Atlanta, USA, Chennai, India, and Madrid, Spain. Basically, those, those other offices, they are where our main customers are at the moment. Uh, then let's have a better look at the technology. We already saw the simple train factory. It consists of many different elements, different equipment like automatic hyper warehouses with stacker cranes, ATVs, RGVs, meaning automatic guided vehicles or rail guided vehicles, monorail transfers, gantry robots, articulated arm robots, conveyors, etc., etc. So some of these are Simcorp's own products, but some we buy also from other companies, like from our parent company in, in Japan. And all of them already by themselves contain a lot of different technologies, uh, like, like on the high level, mechanical technology, electrical technology, computer technology. And if we look in more detail, we can find for example, communication technology, sensor technology, navigation technology, motion technology, battery technology, etc. And uh, to give you a little better idea of these devices itself, I, I will show you a short video. Let's see how, how this goes. Okay, this is from Pigar Tires, uh, uh, belonging to sorry, belonging to Michelin Group, where we delivered certain part of the stream factory. Here you can see, uh, see some uh, devices like gantry robot uh, handing over a green tire to a conveyor, and then there is another device product called monorail transfer, picking up the green tire from the conveyor and delivering it to curing presses. And here you can see the monorail is moving, moving above, fixed, fixed in, in the ceiling. It is now handing over the green tire to a curing press. And after curing, this green tire will be turned into a finished tire. So you can see those finished tires here. And another gantry robot application, one of Simcorp's own products. Now it is uh, buffering and sorting finished tires which arrive, arrive from the production. And this buffering is before testing. After those uh, tires have been tested, they will be palletized. And for that reason, we have another buffer here called palletizing buffer. Again, a Simcorp gantry robot application, which is doing basically the same thing, buffering and sorting tires. And after that, we have the final palletizing. In, in this case, the tires will be palletized in so-called brick rack pattern. This is an articulated arm robot, which is doing the palletizing. Just, just to give you a short idea about the devices itself and, and about the technologies that they contain, but um, if I had to pick just one technology, the one that is most important at the moment, I would say that definitely it is software technology. So a few words about that. Uh, I would say that we have come a long way from the days when software was considered to be the necessary evil in our projects. We didn't put much effort on the software and no one was really interested in it. We just realized that we need the software to make, make the machines run. But as the project sizes have grown and we have started to deliver larger systems, the role of software has automatically become more and more important. It was no longer enough to control individual equipment. We needed to have a system level control above the equipment level. And I would say that today we have really recognize that software is the most important factor that can provide us a competitive edge 
by differentiating us from our competitors. It is quite easy to copy equipment, machines, but it is much harder to copy, copy the software. And if we look at the software, we have software on different levels. We start from the bottom on the picture. We can see the equipment level. It is shown as PLC in the picture, indicating that usually programmable logic controllers are used to control the equipment. And there we use PLCs from certain known suppliers like Siemens, Rockwell, Allen, Bradley, or Strikefruit. And on top of that uh, PLC level, equipment level, we have WCS, which stands for Warehouse Control System. And this uh, level was created by us when we moved from delivering standalone equipment to delivering systems. Today, we use or, or have built this platform on Java, Java EE platform, and, and of course, there is a database for storing the data. And uh, about the hardware, earlier we used to always deliver the hardware with WCS, but today the trend is towards customers providing the server hardware by themselves, and we just uh, deliver the software. And in many cases, we talk about high availability server solutions because unplanned downtime is something that all our customers want to avoid. And basically all SimCorp systems, they include the WCS level, and it is very important part of the system. And some sample WCS functionalities are such as receiving and put away of the goods, order processing, inventory management, picking management. And if we move to the next level, MES stands for Manufacturing Execution System. That is a special software that we offer as part of our Dream Factory solution. So that is intended for tire manufacturers only. So the idea here is that WCS integrates the automatic material handling system and MES brings in the production machinery. And some uh, sample functionality is like recipe management, Make, making sure that production machinery is using the correct up-to-date recipe for each, each different SKU. Tracking, we offer full traceability for each manufacturer tire. If we scan the tire barcode, we can see the full production history starting from the raw material patches used for it. And on, on very top, we have level labeled ERP, meaning that it is customer's software. It can be, and in many cases it is an ERP, but it also can be something else. But the main point here is that there is always an interface from SimCorp's software to customer's software. And today, software engineering is clearly the largest engineering department in, in SimCorp. And then if we move forwards, Already from the very beginning, the SimCorp systems, they have produced data in many different forms, like as log files or stored data in a database. But I would say that only in the recent years, we have realized how valuable this data really is for us. And today we have started to collect the data even in more systematic way. Of course, the raw data as such doesn't help much. The key here is to build analytics, to utilize the data, and we have already taken the first steps toward this direction. And we have seen that already by building very simple analytics, utilizing data from different sources and visualizing it properly, we have, we have many possibilities to improve the system. We have, for example, been able to improve troubleshooting, and provide other tools for our own commissioning engineers. And at the same time, we are exploring the possibilities with more advanced analytics like machine learning and artificial intelligence. And this is something that we are currently doing in co cooperation with a local university. Of course, it is important to provide ourselves better tools, but I would say that business-wise, it is even more interesting to figure out 
which additional services we could sell to our customers so that they can be more efficient. Uh, we, can, we can easily see that we can offer tools to our customers, for example, to increase the output of the factory and to increase the quality of the production. And, and definitely both of these are very valuable. For our customers, if they can produce more with the existing resources and at the same time increase the quality of the production, it will directly show on their bottom line. And the idea of predictive maintenance, it has already been mentioned in, in the earlier presentations, is that we will be able to predict a breakdown. The analytics could detect an abnormal behavior, for example, in a servo motor current or in, in an acceleration sensor. With this, the analytics can give an early warning and pinpoint the problem to the operators. And this enables our customers to check and fix the problem before it produces any unplanned downtime. And again, this will directly show on their bottom line. So definitely there are many, many opportunities to, to sell, sell to our customers. And, and about the better overall view, it is something that we can also provide with the analytics. And I would say that the important point here is that we can provide different views, for example, for, for the factory manager, for the production manager, for the maintenance engineer, for the operator, etc., etc., etc. So what is important for, for the different roles in, in the factory? So I, I would say that Simcorp has come a long way from a machine builder that we were in the very beginning to a systems integrator that we are now. To realize an automatic material handling system, definitely we will always need some kind of machinery. But we have seen that with the software, we can elevate the system to the next level. And I would say that with software, the opportunities are almost endless. And in Simcorp, we are definitely going to the right direction by acknowledging this. So, this concludes my presentation. I hope that I didn't use too much time. Any any questions or comments? Uh, we can now see your teams, I think. Thank you for the presentation. So, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, great sorry. presentation. No, no, it's great. Thank you for great presentation. Uh, we have uh, we are on time, and there is at least one question there from Ruka. Uh, Luca, um, I can read it from here. Uh, what are some key problems in your in your industry that needs to be solved? So, uh, is this from the point of, let's say, point of SimCorp or point of our customers? Can you? Would you like to? Uh, uh, yeah. From SimCorp. From, yes. from SimCorp's point of view, I, I would say that. Uh, may, maybe not the problem, but, but in, in a way it's a challenge. We, we really need to understand the business that we are dealing in. So definitely we need quite in-depth understanding of tire manufacturing process and also these retail customers. We need to understand what their problems are so that we can address our solutions so that they really solve their problems. There is might be, do we have time for one quick answer? There's also this question from uh, Sun Muga Priyan Selva Rayu. I hope I pronounced it at least. <laughs> Maybe actually Jyrki would probably know how to pronounce it. You have a lot of contacts to India. But the question itself is, uh, first of all, thanks for presentation. And have you considered the adop adoption of edge or folk computing services in future systems? Yeah, I would say that um, many, many of our customers, they are kind of traditional. They are somehow sensitive to any cloud computing. At least this applies very, very much to the tire industry. So in, in, in that sense, we are not at the moment, we are not really utilizing cloud 
in, in our systems. We will all, always have on-premises and, and also the plan for analytics, is, it is to have some kind of edge, edge computing for that. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jurki, for your great presentation. And uh, next, uh, we will maybe hear something from uh, Tampere University side. Would you like to uh, say a few words? What, what shall we hear next? Okay. Uh, thank you, Paulina. So this is Jari Nurmi from Tampere University. So we will move on in the, in the program now. We have still three presentations from uh, companies that uh, have offices in Tampere. And uh, the first speaker will be Terrorissa, and he's from uh, Xilinx, so he's a principal system architecture and DSP specialist there. He's been also working for uh, Nokia and Microsoft in the past, and, and I should mention that he has a MSc from Tampere and a PhD from Imperial College London. So, Tero, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yari. I hope you can see my slides. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, I hope most of you, or some of you at least, are familiar with the Xilinx FPGA products, are, or know what the, the FPGAs are in the past. And uh, this presentation is, is now giving you a glimpse to what is to come and where the FPGA industry is, is going. Um, as you can see that Silence has also some people working here in uh, Finland and actually Tampere region, we have the, the most uh, people anywhere in, in, in Finland. So there are a lot of customers using Silence products in, in Tampere and uh, this is mostly giving you an idea what those companies are doing and uh, what kind of positions and challenges and, and opportunities there are in the companies using uh, Silex products. And especially going, going further and, and giving you a head start to, to the future. Let's see. This. All right, so I will focus on this to one particular topic of the ACAP, uh, which is a new name to a family of circuits that are coming after FPGAs. And uh, it is called AI engine. And I, I will give you the introduction and motivation after looking what the actual ACAP is. So the motivation for these AI core series and the AI engine is that this high performance computing, it, it starts to be everywhere. It, it's not just that you have your high performance computers in some university basement or just in the cloud, but it has to be absolutely everywhere. And naturally we know the 5G and wireless, especially here in, in Tampere region, very strong uh, Nokia site and also the, the data centers um, and, and cloud computing. We just heard about fa smart factories and then there is the autonomous driving and naturally everywhere, not as these other categories, a, a single um, kind of task, machine learning, it, it's kind of permutates everything and, and will be applied on all these industries. However, if we looking the technology that is underneath of all our uh, computa computation, so a Moore's law and they're not scaling, they're not scaling anymore. You don't get free lunches. You, you don't double your performance every one and a half years or so. It's just not true anymore that if you have a computational problem, wait for one and a half years and they will be solved by next generation of, of silicon performance. You, you don't get that anymore. So you have to come up with something else. The, the performance and power don't scale as they used to as well. So you don't get uh, automatically more performance and more 
uh, and the less, less power when, when you go from, from Declan to another, uh, it is kind of, if you want one, you can't have the other if you just go with straightforward implementations. You have to have a low power architecture or you have to have a high performance architecture. And, and the same goes with, with throughput and, and latency. And the traditional single core, multi core processor architectures are in the limits or have been in the limits of the compiler technologies for ages. And it is not kind of straightforward just to have more of the same and, and expect you get the benefits you, you wanted. It kind of, we have harvested all the low hanging fruits and, and it is time to think something different. At the same time, we, we're not getting anything more. Uh, we need more. So the computational density, how much computation, especially on machine learning you are required, goes very quickly from the, the uh, giga ops of the past to three orders of magnitude to the tera ops you are required for simple application in, in that sense. Um, from user point of view, a simple application requires much more computation in the actual uh, hardware level. A lot of applications require real-time uh, capabilities, and if not tr true hard real-time capabilities, they require low latency, and the latency is becoming uh, kind of the bottleneck of the system, that even if you could achieve the throughput, it's not enough because you are not achieving the, the latency. And then something that uh, me and Yari have been talking about, Quite, quite few tens of years now about power efficiency is that it's becoming the critical factor. When we started talking about power efficiency, maybe 20 years ago on mobile systems, it was about battery lifetime. The power efficiency now is everywhere. It is the, the biggest uh, contributor, the running costs of data centers is the cooling cost, not the electricity for the, the actual chips or to buy even the warehouse or pay the rent, uh, it's how much money you need to, to cool down the system. So something has to be done. And what we have uh, come up with is then uh, this uh, AI engine and the ACAP. So if you look to the um, current, excluding the FPGAs from the middle here currently, if you look at the uh, uh, CPUs, GPUs, and, and ASICs, they kind of fill this matrix of desirable, des uh, desirable uh, characteristics in a way that you get uh, software programmability and you get that in ASICs if you build it that way as well. And, and, most, and most of the ASICs are being built software programmable these days. And now comes also then the, the cost of the software tooling for the ASICs as well. So when you buy a CPU and, and or GPU, you get a lot of the software uh, off the shelf, but with your own ASICs, you need the programmability and you're now incurring lots of more NRE to, to build the tools as well. None of these are hardware ad adaptable, which has of course been the strong suit of, of FPGAs so on the hardware level, you can't uh, change the functionality to suit your application. You, you have very flexible solution on GPUs, somewhat flexible solution on GPUs, and, and quite rigid on, on ASICs. The workload, workload flexibility then from, from execution to execution is, is very flexible in the software architectures and, and naturally very rigid. Uh, on a standard ASICs that you would most likely to be built. Then, then the really huge uh, factor on these is that it is really difficult to get low latency on CPUs and GPUs. I would say it's, it's quite against the architecture they are being designed to, uh, to achieve low latency with high throughput on, on software programmable architectures. And I would argue that's the one reason why ASICs are being built is that you can then have 
uh, low latency even when you have uh, high throughput. And naturally, it is well known that for a uh, given amount of operations per second, the CPUs are the least efficient and, and then they become the GPUs are efficient, but still very power hungry uh, compared to the, the executed units to the, the ASICs. So what is required here is, is an architecture that can fulfill all these. So by definition, ACAP uh, is being built that it can meet these targets. However, of course, there is now the uh, development time and, and complexity. Traditionally, uh, it took perhaps from months to years to design a complex FPGA systems. But with these ACAPs, that in mind, the aim is to fulfill all these uh, requirements while also reducing the development time drastically from months to years to, to weeks to months. Okay, so um, I'll promise to introduce the Versal, although I will be focusing on the AI engine so far. So this will be the only slide about the, what the, the Versal it is, and, and then the rest will be about the, the AI engines. So the ACAP is kind of legacy of the FPGA in a, in a network on a chip uh, SOC. So you can see on the uh, left, we have uh, like a application class ARM core and then real time processor ARM core. And then there are several uh, smaller processors in the platform management controller, which you can utilize to, to fully uh, use this chip without actually having those other scalar engines up and running. But you can have um, operating operating systems running on the ARM cores and, and depending on need, uh, having off the shelf Linux or then, then real-time operating system uh, running on, on the uh, Cortex R5s, but very capable, already uh, powerful execution engines themselves. And then the adaptable engines, this is the FPGA of the old times, basically inside this, this chip. It has a next generation uh, LAT6 architecture that you can use to make any uh, application, any programmable uh, hardware that you can also have a runtime reconfigurability. This engine as the previous uh, generations have now upgraded DSP engines inside embedded into the, the uh, fabric that can have uh, uh, up to one gigahertz uh, data paths. And also familiar to those who have been using FPGAs before, embedded memory. Now in uh, a hierarchy of different densities and capabilities, so you can utilize different hardware architectures, different uh, memory hierarchies and architectures that suit them better to your, to your needs. Then network on a chip. Uh, this is now that you can connect the chips and the subsystems together in a kind of a uniform way that you don't have any more a memory controller that is for the, the ARM cores or you don't have a, a block that you just serve different unit. It's not mu now much more efficient to utilize the network on a chip for communication also inside different blocks of the uh, adaptable engines, reducing the cost of the communication in, in logic utilization a lot. Then there is a, a something that has become really the strong suit of, of FPGA-based architectures and ACAPs in particular is the hardened interfaces. So even if you would build your own, own uh, ASIC, you couldn't address huge market because there are just no way you could have or predict all the interfaces required uh, and amortize the, the user base with, with the applications. But for us, we have a wide, wide variety of, of uh, users that can then utilize these chips that share the, um, the most common 
interfaces. So there is a PCI Gen 4, which also now C6 support, uh, the latest DDR and LPDDR, uh, memory technologies, gigabit transceivers, 600 gig uh, serial interfaces, MIPI, and so forth that can uh, are supported. And as in the past, a huge variety of programmable interfaces that you can you can uh, have IP or you can just have off the shelf. And then to the beef of the matter, the AI engines. So this is something completely new in the FPGA space. So now if you look in the AI engine architecture hierarchy, we have a array of something that we call AI engine tile. And uh, this will be X by Y, a grid of engines. And uh, each of these uh, engine tiles constitute of a, uh, a vector processor and then a local memory. And uh, having a, a vector processor that has customized instructions for uh, specific cases like for example 5G or DSP and, and so forth. And each of these uh, uh, vector processors have two cores, there's or two units, there's a scalar unit, which is your typical 32-bit RISC processor and a uh, VLIW uh, vector processor. And I will come to this in a bit more detail. But basically you can think of from going from the bottom to up that you have a more coarse grain processor unit that is then being replicated in a, in a matrix fashion with their own uh, local memories. And as you probably know that for high, high performance computing, more and more the uh, memory is the bottleneck of getting the performance. And that is where a lot of emphasis ha has gone. One thing that also diverts from the past is that this is fully software programmable, but it's also deterministic and highly efficient. And the AI engine, you might first think that this is for machine learning only, and for sure this is one of the key applications. So uh, the AI engine is not actually artificial intelligence engine, but adaptable intelligence engine. So it can adapt to support workloads from your machine learning, so uh, CNN, uh, natural language processing, and then vanilla MLP networks. But first and foremost, it can also do a, a huge variety of uh, single processing tasks. So wireless computer vision, uh, data centers, uh, ISM, and so forth, uh, defense applications. There's a lot of DSP capabilities in these, these engines. And I would say that first and foremost on, on DSP and also having a kind of architectural built from ground up support for machine learning algorithms as well. So if you look now this, this um, the multi-core memory bottleneck problem, the, the traditional multi-core architectures that are cache-based will need to hide the latency. They have to have a mechanism how they can uh, switch task or find something to do while waiting in some points for the data to arrive. And they can achieve a, a massive throughput this way, but they, there's no going around the fact that you can't predict what the latency will be. And sometimes the latency can be overly large compared to what is, is desirable. So in the AI engine architecture, each uh, AI engine tile has its dedicated um, memory. And there's a, a plentiful of communication capability between the different engines and then also how the en engines can address the memories around them. So each of these AI engines can actually access 
all the surrounding memories, not only the one that is dedicated to, to itself. So this also means that uh, there's, a, there's a no unpredictable latencies, everything is deterministic, and there's a vastly higher latency, a vastly higher bandwidth uh, for, for the accessing these memories. So you can imagine that they are actually like D0 level uh, in, in the L, L0 level register access to the local memory and they can't ever miss, uh, they can't be a cache miss because there is no caches. And this is reflected on the programming model, how you program these in, that they will be uh, inherently correct by construction uh, systems that will have data flow descriptions, how to actually perform the computation. The, the good thing here is also that overall less capacity is required. They basically have a bit higher than the first level registers and, and the first level memories, but uh, they don't need huge caching. They don't need megabytes of caching SRAM in the, in the architecture. So actually overall the capacity is being put to better use because of course in the cache hierarchy, you're always duplicating the data when you go in the hierarchy. Uh, you have to bring in the, the data to the closer one, but it is a copy of the data you already had. So in here, there are no copies, but you can actually execute it from those memories or access the data from those memories. And uh, uh, this is a, a, a modular architecture and this can be stamped and repeated so the currently available first device that we have in early access is the VC1902 and it has 400 of these, these cores. And uh, as I said, this, this kind of distributed memory hierarchy uh, maximizes the, the uh, memory bandwidth. The, the AI engine, uh, the processor core is highly, highly parallel. So there's an instruction level parallelism. So it's a seven way VLIW engine. And then there is a data parallelism with the uh, SIMD architecture. And uh, there's seven operations per clock cycle. And then there are multiple uh, data operations per clock cycle in parallel as well. So up to 128 uh, multiply and accumulates in, in one core. So that kind of adds parallelism to the parallelism and then there's of course parallel amount of these uh, nodes and uh, AI engine cores. So you can see that there's uh, data types for machine learning and DSP and signal processing on the, on the complex data types. But if you pick, for example, this, this one figure here, that eight by eight real uh, instructions, uh, you have 128 multiply and accumulates, and we have 400 tiles running at 1.3 gigahertz. You get uh, more than 100 tera ops from these devices. So 133 on the, on the faster uh, clock speeds. Then, very importantly, the software paradigm as well is changing. So you use software programmable uh, methods here. So the any developer can can choose their level how to design those. So the architecture overlay with frameworks is very familiar from the machine learning, where you have a a overlay architecture on top of this that you can then program using, for example, TensorFlow that. There is TensorFlow engine running here that you can then uh, deploy your, your neural networks to be executed. Or then you have uh, kernels that are being designed, for example, by Silinx or third parties that are function level binary, uh, libraries that you then create the data flow on your own to your application. Or then you design your own kernels itself. And in some cases, using all these three levels. But there is there's very high level that you don't even know you're using a cap that you're actually programming these uh, engines yourselves. Then completely software uh, uh, built framework. So it's a C, C++ 
environment with very fast turnaround times. And then you use software tools to link the components together and, and create the full executable that you run on this, this ACAM. Very familiar flow for uh, software engineers. And then you can run this, you can run it on simulations or you can run it on device and you can make also so mix these uh, executions. All right, so to summarize, we get the uh, compute efficiency on a hierarchical heterogeneous architecture. And there is a wide variety of, of applications and everything is software programmable. And you can find more from our website. So uh, silex.com slash versal. And it is now in uh, early access coming to a, a general access in a near months. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Tero. Very impressive architecture and, and a nice presentation on that. So uh, while waiting for the questions from the audience, I can I can ask or comment something. So I paid attention to your your architecture where you have the the scalar and and vector parts in the in the course, and that uh, reminds me a lot. Uh, the early research architectures for software-defined radio. So I think this is a very good architecture for, for software-defined radio, but really taking that to the next level. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, these have been kind of the three key drivers. And as you can imagine, this has been in the works for um, a long time. And, and now we have felt that it's the time to, to put this architecture in the, in the limelight. And indeed, there are also for certain applications like uh, the 5G and software defined radio, there are actually specific instructions that can then even boost it uh, even better performance than, than such an architecture could achieve um, if you just design it for general purpose processing. Okay, then I have a very tough question uh, on, on the power efficiency. You, you mentioned that this is somehow comparable to ASICs, but uh, can you really compare how this compares with, with ASIC power efficiency? Yeah, so there are multiple things in here. One, one for example, is then the hardened interfaces. So one of these chips have multiple uh, multi-rate uh, Ethernet max and, and uh, interfaces. And when, when you have those hardened, they are ASIC. They, they, there's nothing more, more there is. And then the, the VLIW architecture, it is, it is just like you would have that alone in, in an ASIC. And it has a memory hierarchy with the legacy of, of Xilinx being, being uh, really kind of always being power driven because there has been a, a disadvantage in the, in the fabric side. So it is inherently already a very kind of power optimized architecture. And then you can um, design your functionalities on the fabric that are specific to your application. So they they will you can customize them more than you could customize them to your ASIC. So th this will not be of course on par that they will be more power hungry if you would do one by one to an ASIC. However, overall, depending naturally your application, that it is very likely that you can get lower power with this because you have customized it so uh, specifically to your application and you have these blocks that you couldn't do your with your own uh, ASIC that are then more programmable and and uh, kind of fits to the application more closely. Whereas, I mean, that you would have to design or have some compromises when designing your own, own system. And I, I would say also that uh, the software tools are a part of the power equation as well, because we provide these chips to hundreds of customers and, and ship in huge volumes. We have the tooling in the level that it's very unlikely a, a company making just a spot ASIC could provide uh, to make them. Yeah, definitely. So there are no questions from the audience, I see. So I thank you again, Tero. 
And we move on. I should also maybe thank the next speaker, who is Frederick Wallström uh, from Cross Control for uh, replacing Marco Elo, who was supposed to give the, the presentation, but he had to move on. Uh, so uh, Frederick is an uh, application development manager at Cross Control. And, and as far as I understood, you are working at uh, Cross Control Sweden, not in Tampere. Uh, yes, that's correct. I, I was thrown into this uh, very quickly. Marco had, uh, gave me a call a couple of minutes ago and, and say that I, I should hold this presentation. So I'll, I'll do my, my best. Okay, good luck. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Cross control is, uh, we are a developer of, of um, electronics for machine uh, machineries and, and uh, heavy equipment. We, uh, we started uh, and was founded in 1991 as a, as a spin off for, uh, from John Deere, or at that time it actually was Timbiak. So we started from the forestry industry. But we have moved into to multiple uh, industry segments where we have seen uh, uh, similar uh, challenges. And, and th this is what I would like to, to talk about today. Basically, what we have seen a need for and, and what we, we are offering our customers is an open SDK for rapid HMI and IoT application development. So uh, let's see how I'm navigating this. Do you, still, do you see my next screen? I think, I think so. Yes. Um, we, as I mentioned, we, we have moved on from uh, into to several segments of, of heavy equipment. We are uh, present in, in agriculture, uh, construction equipment, uh, marine industry, rail industry, and, and several segments. But uh, we see a similar challenges in, in all of these segments where, where they have moved from basically controlling their, uh, their machine with engine control, transmission control, and, and equipment control. And they had some inputs like uh, joysticks and, and uh, maybe put on some gauges to, to show the, the user. But what, what have moved into this, um, this all of these industries is that the requirement of of having uh, more interfaces and more ways to, to look at the machineries. Uh, if we look in, uh, from the, the automotive industry, uh, we, we see a strong trend. All automotives or, or new vehicles are, are connected in somehow to the, to the cloud. And, and uh, uh, for the heavy machineries, the, they are actually following the same, same trend that they like, like to have their machine connected and they need to, to be able to offer them more uh, interface to the, to the user. It's not sufficient today just to show them basically the, the vehicle speed or, or control in the vehicle. They need something else. So if we look at the, the typical interfaces of, of interaction, um, from uh, before, they were basically controlling the machinery. But now, uh, first, you, of course, need to be able to provide uh, primary driver information, such as vehicle speed or engine revolutions or so, something like that. Uh, but Everything is, is uh, also um, collected into the same user interface and they, they uh, users like to have uh, infotainment uh, collected into their um, displays. They need to have uh, the information regarding productivity and, and actually the vehicle information of what, what they are doing. Uh, they need to have an administration interface where they can administrate and, and do maintenance on, on their the machine. Uh, in some application, it's uh, good to have uh, geographical uh, information, such as mappings and so on. They have service tools. They have um, interface where they uh, the user like to go from, from uh, 
cellular phones and, and connect and, and monitor vehicles from distance. Uh, yeah, there are a number of extra interfaces of, of interaction that modern users are requiring for, from um, uh, modern machines. And the challenge for our customers that are typically OEMs with, for heavy, heavy machineries, uh, it's to, to uh, be able to provide all of these services in a quick manner. Because it, this, this is a lot to, to handle from a small uh, development team. So what we have come up with is, um, is a software platform where we uh, first, normally we're using Linux in the bottom. Uh, then we have a platform uh, that is open and a module that uh, uh, or, or in the middle, we, we can say it's a it's an wait for, for connecting several components to, uh, to speak to each other. And what we have components for today is uh, user in, uh, design um, or, or user interaction. So you can create a, a graphical interface. Uh, you can uh, connect um, your um, CAN network or, or field buses. It can also be Ethernet based. We have the um, uh, possibility to connect uh, smart devices as uh, cellular phones and, and things like that. We have uh, in, in, uh, connected codices so you can uh, write and, and uh, add PLC um, code into the, the machineries. We also, for, for agri-specific customers, we have uh, implemented ISOBUS into our devices. So we can connect um, um, a yeah, different type of, of, um, of things back on your tractor. The next phase of this is uh, actually to extend this with uh, First, you will have uh, uh, digital cameras. Uh, previously, we, we always provided uh, interface for, for connecting analog cameras to, to our displays. But now uh, the, the trend is clear. New customers are, are asking for, for more and, and the digital ones in, in this case. Um, we have diagnostics where we have looked into the UDS standard to, to enable a standard interface for, for, for service. Uh, a clear trend has also been in the AI ML area where they like, uh, where, where users like to have more information and, and uh, object recognitions and, and uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, possible to, to uh, having the machine uh, displaying uh, specific information regarding, uh, I don't know, the examples are showing uh, a traffic situation. It would probably not be that as common in, in our industry, but maybe I don't know, in the field, maybe you, you are locating something that shouldn't be in the field and, and the highlights the, the tractor driver for, for such thing. Uh, security is another area where, uh, since uh, users like to have their machine connected to the cloud, uh, we also see a, a bigger threat in, in the security area where, where our equipment needs to provide uh, a layer of security that can be easily, easily implemented. So. We protect uh, uh, the equipment towards uh, external threats. In our displays, we, we support Windows Manager, so you can run several applications within the same screen. Uh, we are looking into um, new uh, HMI standards, such as the Vulkan. Uh, that is that will come in with the uh, QT6 that they are releasing now. Uh, I think it's around in, in December or January next year. 
Uh, we also see some requirements for HMI, uh, HTML5 uh, that is, um, uh, I mean, so there is a huge history of, of uh, writing a user interface in HMI, uh, HTML uh, and uh, the knowledge is there from, from the web development. So some customers like to have this opportunity. We also see uh, requirements for screen sharing, uh, where we utilize VNC mainly. Yeah, we, we have been involved in, in, and looked into this arrowhead uh, thing with, with uh, what we can do with cross-controlled SDK. Uh, and we have uh, seen that this also can uh, provide similar uh, uh, services as, as we have with, with our data engine. So uh, this uh, is an uh, ongoing um, uh, investigation together with, with the productive four. Um, so, um, sorry. Um, Yeah, uh, uh, to conclude my presentation, I would like to, to show you some, some links of where we, what, what we have provided in, in the past. But uh, um, th this can go into the, yeah, you, you can read this later on. So I, I'd like to, to conclude my presentation there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Frederick. Um, if we have any questions from the audience, uh, we can have one or two mm -hmm. questions, even if we are a little bit behind the schedule. Uh, maybe I'll ask one question. So uh, thinking about your customers and, and their machines, so is there any movement towards more automation or even autonomous uh, machines? Absolutely. Uh we see, see a strong trend there, uh, especially in the agri agriculture uh, industry. Uh, Self-propelled vehicles are already present in the, that market and, and we, we see a strong trend there, absolutely. Um, yeah. Cargo uh, handling is another industry where they already have made the transition uh, into more, more self-propelled vehicles. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we don't seem to have any questions from the audience. So, so thank you, Frederick. We will move on now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last presentation in this session will be uh, given by Jouni Mikkonen. He's the vice president of WirePass. And he has also worked uh, for companies Link Motion, Yola, and Nokia in the past. And, and I should mention that he got his PhD from Tampere University of Technology in the last millennium, 1999. <laughs> so, please, Joni. Uh, thank you, Jari. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Now, just need to be able to share my presentation. Just second a uh, couple of clicks away there we go mm. is it now visible yes now we see it all right, so thanks Yari for in introduction. So that was precise and to the point. Uh, for us, for the Firepass, which is my company nowadays, we are 10 years old company, turned 10 years last summer. The roots are very much in the research in Tampere Technical University and the research done some time ago. So more than 10 years ago over there, and we still do a lot of cooperation with Tampere University of Technology due to getting talented 
research engineers from, from there to complement our expertise. And uh, what I'm presenting here is this, how wireless connectivity can be designed for massive scale. Uh, I, I will shortly run on through that. What, what are we aiming for? How do we aim for that? And of course, some of some of the data, benchmark data, on, on a high level, and then prove points and, and summarize presentation. I will skip that in the interest of time, but. Uh, starting from the sort of characteristics of ideal wireless connectivity for scale. So what, what are we looking for? So typically you would want to have, first of all, low cost. So if you scale your network, I mean, it will become impossible to have a lot of expectation for managing that network. You can have operator service and, and to be able to scale a lot you need a frequency to be used so typically unlicensed frequency and without sort of network planning the, the system has to work in order to scale i mean uh, related to the base stations you you need to be scaling without adding base stations or centralized planning and that typically meet, means some kind of multi-hop mesh type of connectivity which is simple to deploy either in local or global environment by, by anybody without any, any regulation. Every network that is based on multi-hop, I mean, has to have some, some countermeasures for, for changing conditions and, and something like dynamic, dynamic and, and local self-healing mechanism and tolerance for interference. And uh, in any, I mean, the basic, basic wireless design criteria is always that uh, you must use spectrum efficiently in order to, to, to build sensible wireless, wireless system and minimize retransmissions sort of succeed on, on, on the first attempt as much as possible. So if we take these four criteria into use and, uh, and we look at that, what wirepass, how, how do we address these? Um, I'm just trying to move this a bit away. So we take the first one that uh, this low cost and, and self-managing operation. So the first point is that uh, what Wirepass has created is what one of our developers interestingly calls, like uh, he calls it collabor collaborative network. So it is, is, it is a network that is built on Bluetooth physical layer, but we totally replaced all the, all the protocol layers of Bluetooth. And, and we use Bluetooth physical layer because it's cheap and it's widely available. So I think the parameters of the first criteria of having low cost is, is achieved by the choice of the physical layer. The second is that in order to scale and, and, and extend the range, be high coverage, you have to be a low power. And in our case, we, we achieve this low power by, by our protocol and, uh, and our power consumption is in the range of, in, in, in operation of DAG is, is in range of seven micrograms. And in case of the router node in the mesh, it's in 20 micrograms. And it has to be low power in order to be, keep the cost down as well for the installation and deployment. For the, for the high coverage, you need multi-hop network. And this is, this is the way how we introduce that. And, uh, and in a mesh, everybody has to implement some logic for that. Ours is cost-based routing that we take basically key parameters that you would expect into account, such as number of hops, uh, buffers in a, on a road, and, and then also link quality. And uh, part of this multi-hop is, and, and all the installation and low cost is that, uh, keep in mind that we don't believe any other network can really implement this battery powered routing. So extending and deploying network becomes extremely easy. If we have a cases where, because the radio environment may change, I mean, we work on 2.4 gigahertz, 
there might be a case where you bring a Wi-Fi, for example, in between and you block some of the channels. So some roads may be blocked. And of course we do automatic rerouting based on interference, or we also do load balancing as we keep track of the, of the buffers. Um, then one key aspect for, for, for efficient use of the spectrum, which was the fourth key, key criteria is that uh, uh, we do all the decisions locally. So we only look at within the radio range, we maintain the, the route to the sink, i.e. to the internet point where, where the traffic is routed out of the mesh. And it's, it's a local decision in a way that you need to only know what do you hear locally, what are your neighbors, and you only need to keep track of the next hop. So, so that allows scalability because you don't need to maintain the whole mesh status, but you, you only keep track of the local situation. And to, to manage this local situation, we also have a dynamic transport power. So we, we don't pollute the, the areas or wireless, wireless resources more, more than necessary. Within this local context, then, uh, if you compare it to BLE mesh, for example, which uses three uh, channels out of the 40 available for the whole Bluetooth spec, because we, we replace the Bluetooth spec, we use 40 channels altogether in the local context, will, which will allow us much more freedom to, to choose high quality channels and uh, have a much more dense network in, in place at any given location. So, uh, so all, all these together make it in a way like each node makes a independent decisions, but uh, they will collaboratively decide then based on the local decisions, what is the best overall mesh network architecture. To increase capacity here, I mean, basically you can have, I would say, one to 300 ratios. So you can have a 300 nodes per, per one gateway, but adding a gateway and, and sort of sync what we call it, the point where you, you have an internet connection. Uh, you, can, you can add simply a sync without any other planning, but naturally if you put it into sensible place in the network, you create the more resilient network and, and more routes to the internet that the nodes can use. And when you introduce a new gateway, nodes nearby the gateway will notice that the hop count is very low to, to this gateway and they of course reroute and, and the whole network mesh is organized differently and then other nodes will make decision based on the load interference and, and network situation. What we also have for easy maintenance is that you have a possibility for, for joining. We have an open joining protocol and uh, they Built on top of that, you can build secure joining protocols depending on what security mechanism you wish to use in, in your own context. So that basically gives you gives you idea on, on, on what are the tools that we use in a mesh to, to achieve the, the scale. And, uh, and this is now if you compare with other mesh protocols, I mean, Wi-Fi can be used as a mesh. It's by far not the most standard way, but uh, if, we, if we take that, so there are now a few points what we compare and, and first is, is scalability without subnets. And this is, this is one issue where our scalability is way superior to the others. Second is how many devices you can have per square cube meter. So this is basically how many devices and connections you can handle in, in, in one radio uh, range, so to say. In our test, I will show you soon what, what we have is, is within one cubic meter. And, and how do we get this is that we have 1500 bidirectional communications and because they are now synchronized, they are radio TX power controlled and they are made within the radio range. So 
we can arrange the 40 channels in bidirectional comms and we can reach 1500 bidirectional comms whereas if you take ple mesh they have three channels where they broadcast and they have collisions and that's where the huge difference comes as an example to ple mesh throughput wise in our case i mean we aggregate everything per gateway and adding gateway increases capacity uh, whereas in, in ble you you are limit you are limited to certain flooding mechanisms and, and you can't increase the capacity in a similar way uh, wi-fi in illustration i mean this of course is, is in totally different range than than ours due to much wider bandwidth that they they use and then related to the battery lifetime so like i mentioned our tag is is below it's it's in the range of five micrograms but the routing device is the key enabler for for creating mesh that can be easily installed and scaled and in our case if you take for for 4000 million power battery you can have a rotor which is lifetime is more than five years which is more than sufficient and sufficient for investment of of this type of network and if you compare that with any other technologies they they are far behind at, at this stage so to put this in perspective was a few numbers how we are working with with this is this is a collaboration with within the 5g force which was a, a collaboration business finland the project so this is actually Tampere Technical University premises uh, we have a, a tool that uh, can visualize our network at any given time so we get the diagnostic information for from the network and we test it into sort of extreme cases and and this case here that we are showing is in here in Tampere in one of the buildings and we are simply testing that uh, that our routing works so we've maximized the number of hops so here the basically the sink and gateway is in one corner and this just to test that our routing works and uh, our, our, our data can be aggregated and, and the system work with maximum here which is 48 hops which is quite impressive number of hops in, in this type of environment. And this is the corner case. I mean, we definitely don't recommend that mesh uses this type, this is like a misuse of mesh, but uh, this is just to take it to, to extreme. And if any customer would do such a case, I mean, it, here it would be simply easy to install another sink and, and gateway here somewhere and, and the part of the traffic would be routed to there and then we would have more options to, to do healing and, and load balance. Then the, I mentioned the capacity. So to prove the sort of calculation that, that we do that how many nodes you can have without any collisions. We have a test set up in the office where we've taken one, one rack. These are actually USB powered wire pass mesh nodes running on, on a nudic chip with uh, with sync on top here actually we have again our, our tool depicts the we call it natural uh, 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 bypass mesh tree structure so so each center point here is one one sink we have num number of sinks here or gateways we have eight sinks and you see how how these nodes have formed a tree automatically and it proves that we can collision free more than thousand nodes in, in one cubic meter and uh, we we do believe that that's kind of some kind of world record and uh, also we, we we are taking this further now as we've proven that we can do massive scale in, in 5g standardization there's a in, in addition to cellular uh, moving cellular forward, there's something called uh, uh, mass, mass, massive mo mobile uh, deployment scenario where, where the requirement on, on a 5G front was 
this is MMTC requirement was million units per square kilometer. And that means basically one unit per square meter. And uh, with our technology, we participated in this standardization. And uh, this has been recognized as a solid contribution and actually been taken into, into, into that scope uh, first as a DEC 2020 standard, as we were able to prove the scalability of our system. And now we are looking also that can it be included in a, in a 5G scope, because compared to the actual requirement of this 1 million nodes per square kilometer, we can reach actually tenfold that with, with our system of frequency reuse and all the other tricks that, that we do. So this is just a physical proof point of, of that fact. Then, uh, to put it into, into perspective, our mesh is the core technology that we do. We believe we are, we are the best out there. We haven't seen really an alternative that could scale in, in, in battery powered form. Applications can be built on, on top of our delivery. We deliver a soft, a software SDK where cu customers can develop own applications. You can see some of the industrial nodes that the customers are building. Cases here range like this is a company in Tampere Treon, who basically does a condition monitoring for industrial rotating machines, for example, in Stura and so factory in, in Finland, they, they measure the machine rotations, get the data that if the machine is working properly, and they use wirepass mesh to rotate data to gateway and, and to their customer application where they analyze sort of pre preventive maintenance needs where the machine starts to break. Another example is, is that uh, we have a positioning tracking, so you can use our mesh also for positioning. We have a positioning engine, so similarly as a BLE and 2.4 gigahertz is used, in many cases you can track nodes when, when on, on the map you first make some anchor, anchor nodes. In addition, this technology is used in lighting, industrial lighting solutions. We have customers like Signify, which is the former Philips Lighting, who's been using this and, and also in logistics, where people want to track high, high number of pallets, for example. But uh, that is the sort of short introduction from the ideal wireless connectivity scale where you need low cost, high coverage, high availability and efficient use of spectrum. Hopefully you got a bit of the understanding that how do we tackle that and uh, I tried to give a few true points how we in real life have, have proven also that to be working. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you Joni. We can I have one or two questions or, or while waiting for that. No, I won't wait for that. There is one already coming. So I don't know if you see this yourself, but how do you consider uh, routing protocols used in wirepass uh, differ or enhance from the IETF RPL? Uh, and have you considered open uh, six uh, low W pan with I believe 802.15.4 radio. So, question. <laughs> yeah, but six low fan is used with IP version six. So, I mean, parts of that can be adopted. But basically, I think we we compare with the with the 802.15.4 radio, and uh, there we have a separate comparison. I mean, it's it's about the use of radio frequency and how do they reuse the the radio. It's it makes a big difference. So our routing is, is strongly integrated with, with the use of the radio band. And uh, our, 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 we, have, we have strong, <laughs> strong uh, we strongly believe and we can also evaluate those differences uh, that where, where do we, where do we beat, beat those guys, but the six low, W pan, I mean, that's more related to IP routing. And we've done IP version six also on top of our radio, but then we use our 
mesh routing within the mesh and and, and map that to to our technology. This okay. IEF RPL that I'm not familiar with. Yeah, but I think your uh, intelligence is in, in the protocol and, and how you control the, the network. So, uh, and I understood that it's a, a distributed control somehow. It is fully distributed. Each node makes independent decisions. Yeah, so are you using some uh, spectrum sensing in each node also? Yes, I mean, they do, every node does a scan uh, periodically in order to understand the network environment. So when they have something to send, they, they will already know which, which node to send to. And they, they establish a network-wide timing based on these scans because each node sends cluster beacons that the other nodes that are within cluster will follow. So that achieves the spectrum efficiency and low power use. Okay. So I think if we don't have any more questions now that concludes this session, thank you, Jouni, thank you all the, the speakers. And I recall that the program will continue after half an hour. There are two different parallel sessions available then so let's have a short break now and, and please join the next sessions if you're interested in, in those.